God's grace and his peace to you from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Today we celebrate the ascension of our Lord. And we may remember what the creed says about this. Forty days after the resurrection. Uh, after the third day, he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. We need to keep in mind a couple things. First of all, we're talking about Jesus. So we need to remember about the incarnation, how God himself takes on human flesh and blood. And after we mention the incarnation, we need to remind ourselves that Jesus did not fully use his divinity. Jesus was physically confined as a human being, but yet, Jesus also did many signs of God. For Jesus is truly God and truly man. And on Good Friday, Jesus, true man, true God, died. But on the third day, he rose from the dead. And this was a bodily resurrection as true man and true God. What is interesting about after the resurrection, Jesus would sort of pop in and pop out of the disciples' lives, meaning that as true man and true God is now different. Jesus is now fully using his divinity. He's no longer restricted by his humiliation. On the day of ascension, Jesus, as true man and true God, now rises in the air. And consider, humanity is now in the direct presence of God. Christ's rising to the right hand of God the Father is not just a physical position, as human understands it, but a position of power and authority being in the presence of God, because Jesus is the Son of God. And notice what Jesus says to the disciples in Luke chapter 24, verse 49. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So Jesus is sending that promise, sending that power from God, so what is the promise from the Father? What is that power from on high? First of all, let's unpack what is the promise of the Father. Throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus spoke frequently of the Holy Spirit and the role that the Spirit would play in empowering believers. And let's just pick this up from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 16 and 17. Jesus said, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Here, Jesus is referring to the Holy Spirit as the helper or the advocate whom the Father would send in Jesus' name to be with the, his disciples forever. Jesus also notes in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 26, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. So Jesus describes the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of truth, who would bear witness about Jesus. Basically, the Holy Spirit's going to keep our eyes pointed on Jesus. The promise of the Father, then, is, is the fulfillment of God's plan to send the Holy Spirit to dwell within believers, empowering them for ministry, guiding them into the truth, and enabling them to bear witness to Christ's saving work. This promise was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, which we'll be celebrating in about 10 days, when the Holy Spirit descends upon the disciples, empowering them to proclaim the gospel boldly and to establish the early Christian church. But getting back to Luke chapter 24, verse 49, 
Jesus instructs his disciples to wait. Wait in Jerusalem until they are clothed with power from on high, indicating that the fulfillment of this promise from the Father would come with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. This promise not only applies to disciples, but actually applies to all believers today, as the Holy Spirit continues to indwell in us and empower us and keep our minds and focus upon Jesus. But why the waiting? Waiting 10 days until the day of Pentecost for the disciples? And for us, again, why the waiting? Well, we need to keep in mind that God's time is not our time. Besides, there is some purpose in God's waiting. The period of waiting between Jesus' ascension and the day of Pentecost served actually many purposes within the early Christian church. The waiting period is essential for disciples, essential for them to prepare their hearts and minds for the coming of the Holy Spirit, as well as to demonstrate their obedience and trust in the words of Jesus. Did they truly believe the words of Jesus? If so, then they would wait. But if they didn't truly believe, they would become impatient and walk away. Another purpose for the waiting period serves as a time of anticipation and prayer, which we can learn from. In Acts chapter 1, verse 14, we see that during this time, the disciples were devoting themselves to prayer. So, this period of waiting allows the disciples to seek God's guidance and direction as they prepare for the next phase. It's also true for us. Are we spending that time in prayer with God's Word, waiting and seeing what God has in mind next? Or, get, or would we also get impatient and walk away? Yes, this is a time of testing. But also the waiting period emphasizes it's in God's time, not our time. We are not God, but God Almighty is God. And throughout the scriptures, we see examples of God working perfectly in His time. Whereas things don't work perfectly when I'm in charge. So the 10 days of waiting between Jesus' ascension and the day of Pentecost demonstrates that God's plans unfold according to his perfect timing, not according to human expectations or desires. And this waiting period underscores our need to trust in God's timing and to wait for his promises with this power to be fulfilled. The waiting period between Jesus' ascension and the day of Pentecost is a beautiful reminder for us that we also need to wait. And this brings up something that's also true that we need to learn. Notice what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Yes, God is patient. We are the ones that are not patient. So there is a reason why God's time is not ta our time. God is patient, and he's waiting for people to hear this beautiful message, to repent and turn back to him. So God's instructions for us now, very similar to the disciples, is wait. But I like how Jesus said this to the disciples right before his own crucifixion and trial. From Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, Jesus said, Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. It is true. Jesus sends us the Spirit who is willing and constantly pointing our eyes toward our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
So hearing these words of Jesus, we also are to watch and pray under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. What does the Spirit do for us? What's the power of the Holy Spirit? I like how Luther summarizes this in his small catechism. Third article, explanation of the Apostles' Creed about the Holy Spirit. What does this mean? Luther writes, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. And this is why we continue to watch and pray. And may Christ continue to empower us through his Spirit. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all our understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.